Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Today's reading is from Isaiah 11, 1 through 5. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of its roots. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. His delight is in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor, and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his loins, and faithfulness the belt of his waist. Here is the reading. The Gospel of the Lord, from the 12th chapter of the Gospel of Luke, beginning of the 49th verse. Jesus said, I came to send fire on the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. But I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how distressed I am till it is accomplished. Do you suppose that I have come to give peace on earth? I tell you, not at all, but rather division. For from now on, five in one house will be divided, three against two, and two against three. Father will be divided against son, and son against father. Mother against daughter, and daughter against mother. Mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Then he also said to the multitudes, Whenever we see a cloud rising out of the west, immediately you say, A shower is coming. And so it is. And when you see the south wind blow, you say, There will be hot weather. And there is. Hypocrites. You can discern the face of the sky and of the earth, but how is it that you do not discern this time? The Gospel of the Lord. Let us pray. Precious Lord, thank you for these prophetic words. And truly, Lord, there is a division. As we seek your face, there will always be division when we seek to go forward in obedience to you and what you have for us. We seek your will. We seek your voice to speak over us. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. You may be seated with the kids like to come forward.
Don't run by the fool. Well, they just must not want us to have any fun at all. <laughs> yeah, you could, you could slip and fall. And if you're my age, you end up in traction. <laughs> Like a megaphone, 
so that they could take their little voice, but with the Holy Spirit, it became a big voice like this. Now the prophets had a lot of things to say to the people, but it wasn't just about rules. Yeah, he shared some, some of the things that he wanted from his people, but especially God wanted his people to know how much he loved them. And so he gave the prophets his Holy Spirit so they could know, hey, you, over in the corner, God loves you. <laughs> and that's what, that's what the prophets did. They had the Holy Spirit on them. Now, there was this one <coughs> prophet. He was known as the weeping prophet. Amen. See, because sometimes when we experience God's presence, it makes us do different things. And his name was Jeremiah. And, you know, he did some funny things. And one of the things he did was he would weep. And he would weep for God's people. He would cry for God's people. And sometimes when the Holy Spirit comes in church, we might cry or we feel goosebumps or anything else. But one of the reasons why we have tissues in our pews, have you ever seen our tissues in the pews? You thought that was just for blowing your nose, right? But that's so that when the Holy Spirit comes and touches our hearts, so that we can maybe blow our face a little bit. It's a special thing. Now, I'm going to end with this and tell you this. Jeremiah was just really young. Yeah. And God spoke to him and he said, I can't, I can't, I can't say what you want me to say because I'm just a kid. But God said to Jeremiah, don't, don't say you're just a kid. Because God uses kids too. In fact, when God uses you, you become mighty soldiers with little feet. That's what you are. I think seven and a half women shoes are but I, I think God uses people no matter how old they are. And you need to know that you're part of it too. God can use each and every one of you, regardless of how old we are. All we have to do is just listen for him. He'll tell us what he wants to say. And maybe because of your words, comes like this with the Holy Spirit. And little ones, God uses little ones as well. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for your love. Thank you for our time together. Thank you that you use all of us who are surrendered to you. Safeguard our young ones. They're so precious to you. Help us to always do a great job in blessing them and helping them grow and to know that they have a place here as well. Help us to listen to the word that you give them. In Jesus' name, amen. Who wants to make a megaphone? Okay. I have some right here. Okay? And you all can make one. And I think there's children's church too, right? Would you like to use this as a craft for children's church? Sounds great. Does that sound like a plan? Yeah. Okay. And we'll just we won't waste any of these because you know these are really important because these are coffee cups. Yes. Do you know what happens? What it's like for an adult to spill their coffee? It's kind of like when you lose your balloon. That's 
for his life for us. <laughs> All right. All right. On your feet. You take this back to Miss Laura. Have a great day. We'll see you soon. Aren't they wonderful? Can we just say thank you so much to everyone that's part of our children's ministry? I also want to take a second just to say, you know, here in August, as we're in August, thank you so much to everyone who's had a hand and, and been so much a part of uh, being on the... the uh, mowing crews and uh, we have folks who aren't even members yet yet that have taken a, a, a spot on the mowing crew uh, it really does make a difference we've talked about this over and over that in our congregation everybody everybody seems to have a role and is actively involved. I would, I would almost have to say there has to be almost a hundred percent involvement of this congregation in so many different aspects of the ministry of this congregation. Wouldn't you say, down? It's just like we talk about this all the time. We're just always completely blown away by everyone's involvement. So I, I just want to say. Thank you. We don't take a thing for granted. We don't take anything for granted. So we're going to continue this, uh, this subject about the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit's presence. And I want you to get your LBW open. And I believe it's on page 85. I want you to, toward the front of no, 84. And we're going to look at the third section of the Nicene Creed. Because we say this all the time. But I want us to focus as we talk about the Holy Spirit. I want to look at the third article of the creed. So let's join together reading that. Are you there? We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, He is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. What? He has spoken through the prophets. He has spoken through the prophets. Even clear back in 325 AD, as the church was gathering together, and the fathers, early church fathers and mothers, were gathering together and they were talking about the various important aspects of this growing movement known as the church of Jesus Christ. That it was recognized through scripture, the various places where God had promised to reveal himself. And one of those places we hear about in the third article of the creed, he is spoken by the prophets. How many times have we said that and we just kind of like say it and we're on to the next thing. I want us to look at this and really look at this carefully. In Hebrews, it says, in many and various ways, Paul says, in many and various ways, God spoke to his people of old by the, what? Prophets. Prophets. But now in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. It's one of my favorite scriptures. Because we recognize the Spirit's activity in the prophets. We talked about his, his presence among the kings. Do you realize that Saul and David were the only two?
two kings of Israel that are recorded that the Spirit of the Lord descended upon them. The only two. You realize they weren't the only, you realize that there were many kings that followed. But it was only Saul and David. Saul experienced a failure and the Spirit of God removed himself. David knew that it was so important to have the Holy Spirit. And once you had experienced that power of the Holy Spirit, there was like no good, no good going back from there. You could not go back. It, it, was, it was just like, and the same thing, church, we need to understand that once you have come into the filling and the fullness of the Holy Spirit, you, are, you have experienced something that not everybody has, but it is a new closeness and a new hunger for Him, a new desire for His Word, a new desire for His presence, a new desire that if you are in error and you have offended or grieved, you realize the Holy Spirit can be grieved. And that you grieve the Holy Spirit. That you're, oh, no, 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 no. I'm thankful that he never says that he's going to take the Spirit from us now. Because since Pentecost, we're promised of an abiding presence of his Holy Spirit with us. We don't have to live in fear. Holy Spirit's going to going to back off from us because of some failure or something we did or didn't live up to. We can be assured of our salvation. We begin to be assured that we can, as Scripture says, can come boldly to the throne of grace. We can be assured that he's never going to go, oh, there's Peterson, man, I'll tell you what, I've just had it, this is the last time. I'm taking the spirit from it. But David recognized that there was something holy there was something precious about his spirit, and he didn't want to even take a chance of being without it. If we can have a confidence that he will never be taken from us, but at the same time, a holy reverence that as we experience him, that it is very special and it's, it's very sacred, and that we don't take it for granted. We're going to talk about a number of ways that the Holy Spirit moved and worked among the prophets. We're going to move very quickly. I wish I had so much time just to, to be in depth about this because it really does deserve it. But there is so much, and I want to take just a second to highlight a number of different prophets. Now let's talk about a prophet because there's a lot of Shim sham ideas today about what it means to be a prophet in the church. Let's understand the traditional, and that's what I'm most familiar with, a traditional definition of what a prophet is and what a prophet does. A prophet in the Old Testament was someone who God had laid his hand upon and was used in a mighty way to speak God's desires, God's heart, to address God's people. Did who? To address who? God's people. It was primarily God's people. It wasn't one some you know grouchy old guy on the street corner with a nasty attitude. I used to have an idea that that's what the prophets were. You know, kind of like those two guys on the puppets, and you're here and he that you know, going back and forth. That's the comedy part of the sermon. Just thought I'd point that out. The purpose of the prophets, as we said with the kids, sometimes God had a word for his people of uh, admonition and direction. Sometimes it was a moment of clarity. Sometimes it was a moment of encouragement. Sometimes it was a moment of hope for something that is coming. That's yet to come. It's not here, but yet to come that the people can find comfort and strength and encouragement. Today's idea in the charismatic Pentecostal church has become for the prophets to be those who kind of like show off the cool things that they get because they're so tapped into the things of God. And we can see different things. 
manifestations that we don't necessarily understand. Yes, those things can be real. However, if we get so focused, I've said this before, so focused on the phenomenon and the things that can go along with it, whether it's people falling out in the spirit or people who, who uh, are speaking in tongues or maybe people who are, who are doing one of these, I know this will be a surprise, okay, who might, you know, experience something of God. It's kind of like, anybody here ever play with electricity? Maybe you really should have listened to your wife and, and you turned off that circuit. But, and you just go and you, you're working with it all of a sudden. And you're like, whoa! <laughs> you know? Sometimes church, as we're encountering the Holy Spirit, we might go, whoa! <laughs> you know? But there is something inside. We know it's real. It's a power, he's a powerful force field. And we don't know how to express it in our body. He just wants to express it. And for Jeremiah, he wept. For others, there was a, a you know, <laughs> there could be like encountering that electric force field. And so sometimes you see in the scriptures, you hear, you know, like in Isaiah, here you go, experience God, and you go, oh! <laughs> and we hear that in church, in some churches. Maybe you came from a church that was really open about the practice of the Holy Spirit, experiencing His presence. And you encountered somebody over here who would go, oh! <laughs> or maybe they do the Holy Ghost crunches. Why is that? We don't understand that. But before we start running it down with our mouth, consider we may be blaspheming the Holy Spirit of God. Because we say stuff that we don't understand about the Spirit. Thankfully, God is, God is merciful and abounding in steadfast love. But sometimes we curse the things of the Holy Spirit. Come on, church. Sometimes we curse the very things that God is doing simply because we don't understand them. So before we immediately label something just because it's outside of our experience. As, oh no, that's craziness doing that kind of thing on church. You know what a fanatic is? You know what a Jesus fanatic is? It's just somebody who loves Jesus more than I do. <laughs> Maybe we stop and consider that for a moment. So all of a sudden, It's not quite so crazy when you hear somebody who's experiencing worship and all of a sudden they let out a wail. Listen, we've got a, a long history in the Christian church of revivals and renewals where people did everything from shaking. There was the shaking Quakers that became known as the Shakers. There was the shouting Methodists. Those were Methodists that got the Holy Spirit of God got hold of them, and for some reason during the service they'd start they would they would start shouting. I don't understand it. But before we start looking and speaking out of our misunderstanding or maybe lack of experience, we need to stop for a minute and say, hmm, that's interesting. Also, we need to understand that if we have experienced some of those things and realized how real He is, how real His presence is, how powerful is His Holy Spirit, that does things we just don't understand. There's no going back. Because at that point, we are forever Ruined for the ordinary. Because you come into an experience that from that point on, there's this place in our mind. Because we go like, yeah, well, I'll tell you what, worship was great today, but man, I'll tell you what, I remember the time I came into worship. Holy Ghost was so heavy. The 
that it completely wrecked me. And man, I'll tell you what, the ladies go to the, go to all the work, putting all their beautiful makeup on and looking all pretty, and yet the Spirit of God comes on them and all that makeup just gets washed off. Are you with me, church? Yes. The Holy Spirit empowered. During the period of the Babylonian exile, there was there were the prophets were used. It could be that the the book of um, Isaiah the prophet could actually be, according to to some researchers, that there may have been a number of Isaiahs contributing, because in the book of Isaiah itself, we hear of things before the exile. When the people were taking on, taken off into captivity, we hear about things after the exile. It sometimes moved around. We hear about people. We hear about coming encouragement of those who will come and be a comfort and gather the nation of Israel back together. It's just it's it's very it's complex. But as the Jews returned from the Babylonian exile, the Lord encouraged them to build his temple. He wanted them to know he would protect them from the threats and enable them to be courageous. God told his people through, we'll say, the prophet Haggai, H-A-G-G-A-I. He said, my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. What a great word to receive from the prophets. We need that as well. The Lord of hosts told the prophet Zechariah that Zerubbabel, the governor of Judah, would complete the temple and it would be accomplished. How? In Zechariah 4, 6, not by might, not by power, but by my Holy Spirit, says the Lord. We must always take these scriptures from the prophets and take them in context of the things that are going on in the very day. And that's another aspect of the prophets and the prophetic message empowered and inspired and being used by the Holy Spirit. We must look at the historical events that are going on behind and in as part of the story. The Spirit taught and led. Ezra said of God, you gave your good spirit to instruct them. That was in Nehemiah 9.20. Old Testament believers were enabled by the Spirit to understand what God said to them, especially through the words of the prophets, even when they refused. The Spirit at times granted special skills. We know that. There are times when the things that the, that, that the prophets did were very strange. God would have them do different weird things. Like, I don't get it. I believe it was Jeremiah that was commanded, go into the center of town, lay naked on the street on your left side for six or seven months. I'm like, wow, that's a problem. But in that, it was... God making a message and making a, of the messenger. Why? Well, there's a word <coughs> attached to that that is being lived out and worked out. And if you think God does weird stuff with this preacher and does weird stuff with you in what he reveals to you, Understand that we come from a long list of the prophets who have done a lot stranger stuff. So if we happen to see a TV show or something where someone who is ministering and healing happens to take off their coat and throw it in the direction of of someone needing healing and a bunch of folks fall over. Just because we don't understand what is going on and the significance of that, and I may not, we need to be careful. 
once again, that we don't run down something that God is doing that's very legitimate. Remember I said, forever ruined for the ordinary. If I could title my message, that would be the title for today. We don't necessarily understand. Do we have eyes constantly in the spirit to look and see somebody else's ministry? How often do you hear this preacher come down and throw rocks at other pastors and other churches? Even if they're doing strange stuff that I don't understand. There are times when I raise a question, but who am I to judge another, like scripture says, who am I to judge another man's servant? That's what the scripture says. Who, who has appointed me to do that? He never did. The spirit pointed to the Messiah. Isaiah prophesied about Israel's coming Messiah, noting that the spirit would rest upon him in Isaiah 42, 1. When Jesus was baptized in the River Jordan, Luke says the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. Throughout the scriptures, we see scriptures and we believe that they speak of the coming Messiah. Isaiah 9, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulders. And his name, his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of his kingdom and his government, there shall be no end. Isaiah 53. By the stripes we are healed. Isaiah chapter 11. A spirit... of wisdom, a spirit of knowledge. As Matt helped us out and he read that. You see, the fascinating thing is there can actually be somebody even before Jesus that that's referring to. And it could have been somebody we would least likely think of, that it applies to, like old Cyrus of Persia. Here's a guy, who's a guy who's a real dirtbag. And yet, God sees him as the answer to who got to the people and the needs of the people of that day. And he's just going to use that person because he chooses to use them, regardless of what their color is, or regardless of their political party, or regardless of they don't fit with who the, the church or the people of God's people look and go, well, you know, God should only use, you know, good and holy, perfect people. Mm -hmm. Haven't we heard that before? Mm -hmm. Hey, listen, I'm so excited about this message, and it is so relevant. Now, let me tell you about a cat named Hosea. You remember the story about Hosea? You talk about God using jacked up situations. Hosea had this unfaithful wife. Her name was Gomer. That may have been one of the problems. I, who names their girl Gomer? I don't get it. If you think for a minute that God cannot use divorced people or blended families, or you think that God only uses the perfect and the righteous that deemed worthy to receive his anointing and his blessing and his presence and his power. I think we all know that just ain't going to fly. Sometimes it's specifically because God loves to spin us around in our tracks and our heels. Before we stop, start to you know, look, you go, oh, well, God can only work things out if things just happen in a very conventional way. You know, like we're used to it, traditional, it's traditional anymore. <clears throat> can we remember Mama Mary? It 
who's probably 14 years old, when the Holy Spirit descends upon her and she conceives and bears Jesus. We don't know how many folks looked at that situation you know, you know, Mary, the one that's, oh, Mary, you know, Mary without this. Well, can you imagine how the townspeople chatted? God specializes in using the oddballs that would be passed over. I don't know that. They, if any of the prophets ever set out, I really have this funny feeling that, in fact, it's, I can tell you this is gospel truth. None of the prophets would have ever applied for their position. Oh, yeah, pick me. I'd love to look like a clown down at this down center and shave half my head and walk around. Oh, yeah, I would love to do that. None of these prophets ever desired to be called up for God's service. Let's consider for a moment the, what I call the prophetic reluctance. Can you say that with me? Prophetic reluctance. And that's one of the things that you constantly find is we read about the Holy Spirit's empowerment among those that he calls. Well, there's this guy named Amos Tekoa. He was a dresser of figs. He was a fig farmer. I didn't say pig farmer. He was a fig farmer. That was his thing. And God came to him and said, Okay, Amos, this is what I want you to do. I want you to stand there in the southern kingdom, and I want you to address all the nations surrounding, and I want you to call it Israel into accountability because they have practiced injustice. Injustice. To the nations where you have been the been oppressed you are going you have become the oppressor and God called his people into accountability because of what they had been doing God hates injustice what does the Lord ask of you Micah says but that you love justice practice kindness and walk humbly before your God. So many of these magnificent words come from the prophets. How did they come from the prophets? Did they make this stuff up? They wouldn't have said it on their own because what they said came with a price tag. When it says honor a prophet and grant him the due that's granted to him, do you know what that due is? Death. Oh yeah, sign me up. Funny how today's church, we talk about, let's, oh, I'm a prophet. I'm going to put it on my business card. Amos didn't want any part of it. He knew the penalty of being a prophet. It's not a way to gain friends and influence people. That's not the way to make friends and, 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 and have everybody speak well of you. But they didn't make this up on their own. They only spoke as it was revealed to them by the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Jeremiah said, Woe is me if I do not proclaim the word of the Lord. There was a fire within me burning that could not be quenched. And I was weary with forbearing it. And I must share. pointed to a Holy Spirit that was a great sustainer. Isaiah 40 verse 7. I know I'm jumping around this. The grass withers, the flower fades. Because the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Who's the breath of the Lord? The Spirit. Bro, all night. The Spirit of God. The grass withers, the flower fades because the Spirit of the Lord blows upon it. 
Surely the people are grass, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God endureth forever. Oh, there's so much. I wish I had.